The LinkedIn Podcast Network is sponsored by TIAA. TIAA makes you a retirement promise, a promise of a guaranteed retirement paycheck for life. Learn more at TIAA.org backslash promises pay off. LinkedIn presents. I'm Maura Aarons Mealy, and this is The Anxious Achiever. We look at stories from business leaders who've dealt with anxiety, depression, or other mental health challenges, how they fell down, how they pick themselves up, and how they hope work will change in the future. U.S. Surgeon General Dr. Vivek Murthy has never shied away from talking about emotions and how they affect our health. And our mental health underpins much of his work because mental health determines so much. I've always respected Dr. Murthy for this. And now, as mental health and surging rates of mental illness come into the foreground, regulators and health leaders are also thinking about best practices to recommend. According to Mindshare Partners, a nonprofit that helps organizations become more mentally healthy, 76% of U.S. workers reported at least one symptom of a mental health condition like anxiety or depression. And here's the thing. Our workplaces can contribute to poor mental health, from toxic bosses to no separation between work and home to having to work straight through while you're sick. In fact, 84% of respondents in the Mindshare survey reported at least one workplace factor that had a negative impact on their mental health. Dr. Murthy and his office know just how intertwined work and mental health are. That's why today they're releasing a new framework around mental health and work to help leaders and workplaces become healthier. The framework includes what they see as five essential building blocks, social connection, meaning at work, opportunity for growth, work-life integration, and protection from harm. Here to talk about why now is the moment for such a framework is Surgeon General Vivek Murthy. I was really excited when I heard you were announcing this framework. I I see it as a really big step for the government to be saying this matters and we do bring our mental health and mental ill health to work. Mm -hmm. Why now? Why is now the moment for a framework from your office on mental health at work? Well, Maura, I have been so concerned about the mental health and well-being uh, of people across our country. It wasn't just the stress and strain of the pandemic which has been incredibly hard for people. And keep in mind, during this pandemic, many of us lost loved ones. We're trying to figure out how to homeschool our kids, how to telework, you know, for the first time. But we were also dealing with extraordinary uncertainty, Mm -hmm. not knowing necessarily when we could come back to work or when our elderly relatives would be safe and wondering uh, ourselves, you know, if we were going to get sick and what consequences that would have. Mm -hmm. So on many levels, this pandemic has been incredibly stressful But the mental health of people in America has been under strain long before the pandemic. And it's why I've made mental health and well-being the key issue that I am focusing on as Surgeon General. It's why we issued off the bat a Surgeon General's advisory on health misinformation, which was causing incredible stress and strain in people's lives. It's why last December I issued a youth mental health advisory to call our country's attention to the youth mental health crisis and why we recently have focused a broader initiative on healthcare workers who are burning out in extraordinary numbers. But this recent publication that I'm releasing now, the Surgeon General's Framework on Workplace Mental Health and Wellbeing, this is the first time that the Surgeon General's office has ever issued a product on the workplace. And I'm doing so now in particular because uh, we have so many people who are going through a reckoning when it comes to work, who are asking themselves what they want out of work, but also what they are willing to tolerate and sacrifice for uh, work. And this is not just folks who are sitting behind a desk and working behind a computer. It also includes folks who are ringing the cashiers in our grocery stores, who are working in our factories on front lines, you know, who are in government and nonprofit organizations and businesses. Like across the board, workers are re-examining what they want from work and what they want from life. And it's why around 80% of workers actually not only say that the workplace has contributed negatively to their mental health in some way, but they, around that same percentage, around 80%, also say that they are going to be looking for workplaces that support mental health and well-being going forward. Yeah. 
I mean, those numbers are staggering. But as you mentioned, this is this is a big step because it is about work. I mean, what would you say to someone who says, you know, a CEO of a company who's like, I'm a capitalist, stay in your lane, Dr. Murthy, like, I'll focus on my business and you can focus on health. Like, what's your answer to that cynic about the importance of mental health at work? Well, I think when you do what we have done, which is to look closely at the data and economic studies, sociological studies, and most importantly, health studies, when you talk to academic researchers, workers, nonprofit and business leaders and business associations, what you learn is what we learned is that health and the workplace are inextricably linked. Mm -hmm. There's no way to separate them. In fact, we see that when people are doing well with their mental health and well-being, they contribute more to the workplace. They are more productive. They're more creative. They're more likely to stick around. Retention rates are higher and they have a positive effect on the people around them. And as anyone who has led an organization will tell you, that is absolutely essential for the output and health of the organization. So the bottom line is focusing on mental health and well-being in the workplace is good for workers, but it's really good for organizations too. It's a win-win. And it's why you know I see this as a critical part of our work. And again, you know, the broader focus that I've had on mental health and well-being is about the idea that all of us have to step up in this moment if we want to improve the health and well-being of the country. That includes government, it includes educational institutions, individuals, but it also includes workplaces. And I wouldn't want anyone to leave this framework without recognizing that, gosh, workplaces can have a powerful impact right now at a time where a lot of people are struggling. Not to mention we spend a lot of our time at work. <laughs> so absolutely, I want to zero in on something that is really highlighted in your framework. And it's it's not obvious, I think, which is, you know, I think a lot of people think that mental health challenges, mental illness, or just, you know, having a rough time is about something else. It's about your life outside work. But data show that actually what you do during the day, how you're treated by other people at work, by your employer, impacts your mental health. And I'm curious, you start the framework from a baseline of protection from harm. Why is that important for workplaces and for workplace mental health? Yeah, that's really important to understand because recall we said that around, you know, 80 percent, it's actually 84 mm-hmm. percent you know, of workers are saying their mental health has taken a hit because of some aspect of the workplace, right? Right. Uh, When we recognize that, like that tells us very clearly that this is not just stuff happening outside of work. This is stuff happening inside work that's having uh, an effect on the mental health and well-being of workers. And and the truth is for too long, I think we've had this artificial barrier between work and home, Mm -hmm. right? We've assumed that whatever happens at home, you should be able to just check at the door when you come to work and it shouldn't affect you and vice versa. But that's just not how human beings are built. If your child is sick and you're really worried about them, that's going to affect how you are at work. And it doesn't mean that you're a weak human being or that you're not a good worker. It just means that you're human. (laughs) Uh, Similarly, if you have a tough time at work, either a really bad day or you're being harassed at work and that's causing stress in your work life, that's going to spill over into how you interact with your family and how you show up for your friends and how you show up in your community. So if we recognize that, that that interplay between work and home is not a weakness. In fact, it can be a strength. That means that when we support people in being there for their family when they're ill, for example, by supporting paid leave or having flexibility you know, in, in workplace hours, we allow them to address some of those external stresses, which helps them at work. And similarly, when we create work environments where people can find connection and community where they know that they're valued, where they matter, where they have a voice, where they have a chance to to really grow at work and where they're protected from harm, that also can create a kind of ease and a lower level of stress that can positively impact how they interact with family, with friends, and with their community. So this interplay is really important, but we've got to recognize that there's a critical role that the workplace plays here. And we can't just say, well, work is work and mental health is mental health. Uh, These two are deeply intertwined. Yeah. Well, let's take a minute, um, step back. I'd love you to highlight your framework um, for us and and sort of pull out the pieces that are very important to leaders as they're looking at the issue of workplace mental health and what to do about it. Well, Maura, the framework that we have built centers around the worker voice and equity. That's really the the central focus point of this. Mm -hmm. And as I said before, this applies to workers from all 
walks of life, big and small organizations, folks on the front line doing manual work, folks who are behind computers, all of them. But there are five key essentials that form the foundation uh, for this framework and essentials that I believe can give organizations a foundation for mental health and well-being. The first is protection from harm. You know, we all have a need for safety and security in our lives. And if we are in a workplace where we don't feel safe, either physically or psychologically, then that takes a toll on our mental health and well-being. So for workplaces to prioritize that safety, to also enable uh, rest, adequate rest for people so they know they can come to work and be at their best, for workplaces also to support a normalization of mental health, you know, such that people can go out and get mental health care and not feel ashamed about it. This all helps create an environment where people are protected from harm. And it's important also to note here that this is about also diversity, equity, and inclusion and accessibility. Because whether you are living with, you know, a a disability, whether you are, you know, a member of a minority community, if you're a woman, if you're a member of the LGBTQ community, like it's important that everyone feels that the workplace is someplace where they can show up and be safe and be treated. And be seen also. That's a piece of it. Absolutely. Absolutely. Be seen as well. Uh, That's right. You know, the other, that's a first essential. The second essential we focus on here is connection and community. Mm -hmm. We know, as we talked about before, that having a sense of connection to people you work with has a material impact on how you feel, but also on how you perform in, in the workplace. And so cultivating trusted relationships, creating the kind of practices and spaces where people can come to know one another and uh, as human beings and not just as skill sets, this is incredibly important. Mm -hmm. The third essential is around work-life harmony. Uh, You know, we know that it's so important for people to be able to care for their loved ones and take care of their responsibilities outside of work. And when we don't allow them to do that, either because we do not have sufficient flexibility at work, we don't allow them the kind of autonomy uh, over how their work is done, or we don't have the kind of leave uh, policies that allow them to take that time without fearing for losing their job, uh, then their stress levels rise, their life outside of work suffers, and hence their life at work will also suffer. But part of this also is about respecting boundaries, Mara, between work and non-work time. <laughs> my favorite word, Dr. Right? Murthy, my favorite <laughs> word. <laughs> Yeah. And and this is a lot easier in some ways 30 years ago, right? Before we had technology that was incessantly and relentlessly connecting us to work in the evenings and weekends during vacation time, during sleep time. Like how Mm -hmm. many of us, for example, get up in the middle of the night and check our work email? You know, how many of us on weekends and on vacation time even will check in just to make sure we're not missing things at work? These are things that we do in order to you know, try to keep up with our inbox or try to be good workers. But the truth is that when we do not have adequate time to renew and to just rest, it really does impact us and it, co- it contributes to a chronic fatigue and a sense of chronic stress that really does take a toll on our work and our home life. Mm-hmm. So that work-life harmony is really essential. There are two other essentials that we lay out here. Uh, so remember, protection from harm, connection and community, work-life harmony. The fourth is mattering at work. We know that everyone needs to know that they matter and that their work matters. And we can help people see that by, one, giving workers a voice in workplace decisions, giving them a seat at the table, but also by building a culture where people feel recognized, where the connection between what they are doing and the mission of the organization is also clear. And I want to be, you know, underscore one thing more. This isn't just about knowing that your work is saving lives or preventing hunger around the world. Those are worthy goals, you know, but it, those aren't the only ways to contribute to, to meaning, right? If I'm cleaning the floors, you know, in a school and making sure the kids have a chance to come and learn every day in a healthy, safe environment, that's an important service. Um, you know, if I'm serving food in a cafeteria in the workplace and making sure that people can get food, you know, during lunchtime, and, but also get an injection of, of, of kindness and you know, and compassion uh, during their workday, that is an important service. So helping people see the meaning in their work, providing them with a living wage, these are all ways that we tell people you matter and your work matters. And the last essential is an opportunity for growth. You know, people across the board want to grow in their own unique ways. You know, some may want to, you know, advance along the, you know, this, this sort of workplace structure. Others may want to grow in just in terms of their own knowledge and skill set. 
Uh, making sure that we're offering training and education, that we have mentorship opportunities for workers is so important. And these have to be equitable as well. You know, when people feel like others have chances to advance and grow, but they don't, uh, that's another way that, that we send a message, sometimes inadvertently, that they don't matter a, as much. Uh, and we also grow through feedback. You know, feedback is one of the toughest things to provide and provide well, but training uh, folks on how to provide that feedback so people have a sense of what they're doing well, but how they can continue to improve is absolutely essential. So you put these five essentials together, and what they do is they provide a foundation for how organizations can cultivate and support the mental health and well-being of their workforce. The LinkedIn Podcast Network is sponsored by TIAA. In the last 100 years, we've seen financial markets swing, new currencies come and go, decades of savings lost in days, all showing that a retirement plan without a guarantee, quite simply, isn't enough. So more than a retirement plan, TIAA makes you a retirement promise, a promise of a guaranteed retirement paycheck for life, a promise that pays off. Learn more at TIAA.org backslash promises pay off. I don't think it's an accident that a lot of the things that you mentioned, such as feeling like you matter, having autonomy over your schedule and how you manage your time, feeling recognized, those are all the things that studies and surveys for years have been telling us people care about almost as much, sometimes more than they care about their paycheck. Hmm. But businesses sometimes just never seem to get the memo. (laughs) This stuff sounds so meaningful. And yet a lot of our modern work practice is set up to not enforce this. How do companies start? Are you thinking about what is the first step after people read this framework? Yeah, so that's a really good question. And I think it's important for all of us to recognize that for decades, we have been building workplaces that haven't always supported some of these essentials. Some have, many haven't, but we haven't really approached the workplace from the framework of mental health and well-being. And so, yes, it will take some time for us to really build this in, but I feel a sense of urgency around this because the need is great. There are millions of people struggling all across the country, and when they are struggling, that means that the organizations they serve are also going to be worse off. So one place to start, though, is to listen to your workers, to bring them to the table and to ask them what they need Mm -hmm. uh, to contribute to and support their mental health and well-being. And we provided this framework and a diagram that goes with it so that uh, it could be a starting point for conversation for uh, for leaders and organizations that they could bring to the table with workers to say, you know, how do we measure up, you know, against uh, these Uh, these five essentials, and what can we do better? So this is meant to be a tool for organizations to start a conversation and then also to think about the work that they are doing and where they perhaps may have gaps. But we also wanted it to be a tool for the workers themselves. You know, as they are looking at workplaces and trying to think about where they work, we know that around 80% are saying that they want to work in workplaces that make mental health a priority. Well, this will give them a a framework through which to think about what their Mm -hmm. potential workplaces are offering as well. So, so just to be clear, I mean, because it, it's it's kind of amazingly common sense and yet also radical. What you're saying is, by being good humans to the people that you work with, you can actually help people's mental health <laughs> <laughs> and have a better business. Yeah, well, you know, I find that sometimes the most powerful advice is rooted in simple core lessons, and I've uh, just always found that as human beings. We all want to be seen and understood for who we are. We all want to know that we matter and we all want to be loved. These are three essential needs. And I think what workplaces can do is they can really help people see that they matter. They can help them feel seen and understood. And the truth is when they do that, then they enable people to be more, to do more, to contribute more. And it it is some, you know, this part of this that's about policies and programs, uh, Maura, when we talk about making sure that people have a living wage, making sure that they are they have paid leave available to them, when we talk about ensuring that there's flexibility, you know, mm-hmm. in the workplace. and Right. Like the nuts and bolts. Yeah. Yeah. There's a lot, in the, you know, in terms that we need in terms of policies and programs. But I think the, the foundation which a lot of this is built is culture. 
right? And mm-hmm. creating that culture where, which is truly people centered, I think is is the shift that many organizations may find themselves reflecting on, because that culture is reflected in how people treat each other, right? And especially when no one's looking, right? It, it, it's about you know when a worker has a crisis. You know, are other people stepping up to help them? Do they feel that they can go to folks in the workplace and, and share what's actually going on in their life and what kind of support they need in that moment? Culture is informed, again, by the things that we do in the small moments. You know, as Sigal Barsade, you know, who was my old business school professor and uh, a wonderful professor at Wharton at the University of Pennsylvania, as she uh, once told me in one of her many nuggets of wisdom, she said, Vivek, you know, building a connected culture in the workplace, a healthy culture is often about the small movements, not the grand gestures. It's about, you know, does somebody stop by and uh, check in on a coworker at the end of the day for a couple of minutes because they know that they've been having a hard time? Do they, you know, bring them a cup of coffee because uh, they know they're having a busy day and they didn't have a chance to go on a coffee break themselves? Do they stop to help them, you know, with the papers that they dropped on the floor, uh, even though everyone's having a busy day, but that 30 seconds they know would make a difference in their lives. It's about the small things that we do that tell people, hey, you matter. I see you. And so, yes, this is fundamentally about how we are as human beings with one another. It's about building a culture of connection, of valuing every human being. And when we do that, that culture can then inform the policies we create, the programs that we build, and ultimately the the talent that we recruit. Yeah. I'm curious. I want to come back to listening because you you said you could start by listening. Obviously, listening is a big piece of your leadership style. Do you see a shift when you talk to leaders out there around knowing versus listening? It, It seems to me that a lot of leaders, and you've been to business school, you know, for a long time, it was all about knowing the answers. And And another shift that's happening here, it seems to me, is encouraging leaders to listen and help figure out together. Yeah, this is such an important point about leadership uh, that you're talking about. And I want to be clear, when I leadership applies to all of us, we're all leaders in some way, shape, or form, whether we have people reporting to us or not, we influence the people around us. And I think there was this old model of leadership that it's a person who never has doubt, who knows all the answers, who's never stressed and who's the loudest voice in the room. I find that that is not the form of leadership that is always the most effective, but it's also not what many people crave. You know, I think increasingly we're understanding that listening is as powerful and sometimes even more powerful than talking. It's a way of not only learning, but also helping people see that they matter, uh, that they're valued. I think also being real with the folks you work with is also important, and that means being open about when you may have doubt or not may not know all the answers. And that doesn't, again, make you a bad leader. It makes you somebody who's honest. And I think people want honesty and realness from the folks uh, who lead. I'm curious how you model vulnerability. Like say you're having ang- you're anxious or you didn't sleep well the night before because your kid was up or <laughs> what have you learned about sort of modeling vulnerability as a leader? What I've learned about vulnerability is that one while it can be uncomfortable at times to be vulnerable, I find it often feels good because, it's, again, it's about being real. Yeah. It's about tearing down those walls that we often feel we have to put up to show a brave face or to you know, portray some image you know, of a leader that we think other people want. But being someone other than who you are, conveying feelings other than what you feel, like these are actually stressful because they require us to contort Mm. the reality that's inside of us. So I found it to be good for me. But I've also found it to be reassuring for the people I work with, people who often are struggling with their own concerns and doubts. And when they see it in the people they work with and their leader, it doesn't tell them, oh, gosh, now I'm not confident about my leadership. It tells them, okay, this is a space where we can all be real with each other. Yeah, And that's really important because you want the people you work with to be honest with you about what they're going through. But more, I should also just say that this is a process for for everyone. Yeah, You know, many of us have, not just in workplaces, but in society more broadly, been told that we have to put up these veneers, you know, that we have to erect these walls and not let people really see what's going on inside because otherwise they'll judge us or they'll push us away. 
And, you know, yes, I understand there are times where we have to be mindful of that. But the workplaces that I have found to be the most powerful are the ones where people can be real with one another, where they can recognize their obligations to one another as well and their connection on one another, and when they can show up and support one another. And that makes not knowing all the answers a whole lot less scary. Because you know that even though you you may not know everything now, that together you will get through it. You will figure out where you need to go. And again, that's just a lot easier when people are honest about what they know and what they don't know. It makes our uncertain times also feel a little bit less scary, I think, for everyone. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Dr. Murthy. I really appreciate it. Well, thank you for not only covering this topic, but for talking about it with such just humanity and such empathy and so much realness. Uh, I think what we have talked about today, I suspect, may reflect a lot of what people have been feeling, not just during the pandemic, but for years, which is maybe a struggle between who they really are and who they feel comfortable being at work or a worry that... Yeah. There is a tension between the needs uh, you know, of their family and their friends outside of work and what they have to deliver at work and a question really you know, about whether it truly is possible to have a workplace that supports them as whole people and that cares about their well-being. But from my own experiences and from the organizations that I have seen as well, I think not only is it possible, but it is so necessary right now mm -hmm. for us to re-anchor our workplace cultures and structures and policies around people and around their mental health and well-being. And if we do that, we will find that not only uh, will we allow workers to thrive and to truly uh, be fulfilled, but we will also enable them to contribute more to the workplace. And that is why I think workplace mental health and well-being is a win-win proposition, and it's the focus that we need right now. That's it for today's show. Our show is produced and edited by Mary Dew. Our assistant producer and sound engineer is Nick Krinko. Many thanks to the LinkedIn Presents family, to all of our guests for sharing their stories, and to our advertisers who bring you the show. If you love The Anxious Achiever, tell your friends. Subscribe, leave a review, follow us. You can also tweet me at Mora AM or find me on LinkedIn, where you can follow me, message me or subscribe to my newsletter for more from the anxious achiever world. Thanks for listening. <laughs>